Good morning to everyone here and online uh, and on Twitter and wherever else you may be following us. I'm Anne-Marie Slaughter. Uh, I'm the president and CEO of New America, uh, and this is our uh, panel on the technology deficit uh, attracting tech talent uh, into government and civil society. So I, first thing I just have to say is this panel is the reason I came to New America. I mean, in microcosm, that is really true, uh, partly uh, to be able to be with this great group, but really when I looked at New America, and I was on the board for a long time before uh, I left Princeton in, in the last summer and, and came on board, what I saw when I looked at this place was the place in Washington that is, I think, best positioned to bridge technology and policy. Uh, and here's how I see it, and then I'm going to lead into uh, this report uh, and this conversation. Uh, but, you know, I'm from the policy world, from the foreign policy world, but it, really that, that, that domestic international difference is not nearly as important as the digital natives, non-digital natives difference. Uh, and in my policy world, when I went back to Princeton, the fact that I could use Twitter made me a guru. Right, made me a tech expert. I'm, my colleagues would, anytime technology would come up, my colleagues would look over and say, oh, well, Henry understands that. That's because I could use Twitter. That was the level of technological sophistication required to bump you into a different place in the policy world. So, and then I, you know, went and hung out at PDF for, uh, for the, uh, the Personal Democracy Forum for two days and saw all this energy and all this excitement and all this possibility, mostly young people, digital natives, thinking about how to change the world using technology. And putting those two worlds together is absolutely essential. The people who are in a position to make change, who understand the traditional way policy works, and I'm going to come back to that in a second, and the people who really understand an entirely new horizon of possibility through technology. So that intersection uh, is what we're about today. And what we're about today is talking about how do we get more technology, or more importantly, more technologists, into government and civil society. That's what the, the uh, Ford-MacArthur report is about. That's what we're going to be uh, talking about. And, it, you know, there's a number of points, that right? The, the, the current pipeline is insufficient. <laughs> that is clear. I mean, trying to hire people, again, at state who had real technological savvy. Part of it was they're looking at the bureaucracy and fit thinking, how on earth do I ever make a difference? Uh, part of it, of course, is that they have lots and lots of options in the private sector, uh, and neither government nor civil society can match those salaries or anything like it. So we have to be able to offer something else. And that something else is the possibility of really meaningful work but that gets you back to the bureaucracy. Uh, so, you know, the, the uh, problems of salary, of kind of creating that pipeline, uh, the barriers uh, to recruitment and then to retention, we did get some fabulous people in and some of them did some great work. Jared Cohen's at Google Ideas. Right? He, was, he worked with me. He had all sorts of exciting ideas, and he did implement them. It was impossible to keep him. Uh, it really was. Now, partly, yes, Google Ideas is like a one-in-a-million job. I get that. But just in general, he felt like he'd done as much as he could do within the government. But that's exactly the kind of person you need to keep, or at least you need to keep coming uh, in and out. Um, the other, so thinking about this, and one of the ways that I think this report is so helpful is, well, let's look at models from other fields, right? Let's look at places that work, that do actually succeed in integrating technology uh, with uh, other areas uh, of work, uh, and let's see how we can, we can uh, borrow from those. And then let's look at how we do education and training and critically, and I know we're going to hear from this, culture change, right? Because the biggest difference that I found, and again, if you go back to my example of working in government and then running a public policy school and being back in a public policy school and PDF, the culture is radically different, right? We always say, well, it's the difference between hierarchy and, and networks, uh, the vertical and the, and the horizontal. Yes, that's true, but it's so much bigger than that. It's, it's really a whole, it's, it's what I would call the difference between the culture of the presumptive no and the presumptive yes. The presumptive no, you come to me, you say, uh, you know, I've got this idea, and I say, well, why would we want to do that? And I grill you, and I ask you all sorts of questions you're not ready to answer, and at the end of it, I say, well, maybe, and you walk out thinking we're never going to do it. The presumptive yes is the culture of Silicon Valley. It's the culture of technology. It's 
that's a cool idea. Let's see whether that would work. So you don't always do it because sometimes it's not a good idea, but it's a presumptive yes. So that culture change, the presumptive yes is not the culture of Washington. I think you can, <laughs> that's maybe the understatement of the century. Uh, so, <laughs> the, so all of those things have to be tackled. But before we, we turn to our, our panel and, and we're going to talk about this report and we're going to talk about the work that, that uh, various of, of us are doing, both in government uh, and now out of government, I want to leave you with one final set of thoughts, which is we do need to get lots more technologists into government and into civil society. I mean, we've got uh, 10 coders upstairs and a whole group of people around them. They are um, you know, hugely helpful for all of our different areas of, of policy, whether it's education policy or social policy or economic policy or foreign policy. They're valuable not only because they know technology, but also because they are often skeptical about technology, which is also important, right? The non-technologists often think, great, we'll get an app, right? We'll get a program. The technologists are often the ones who also understand the limits of what technology can do as well as what, what it can do. So you need both of those things. But you also, and here's where I would leave you, and this may be the next report, you also need to teach technologists much more about policy, politics, and process. I travel between here and the California, and in DC, nobody really gets technology except for some of the people on this panel, and Tom Khalil will be joining us, and you know, there's a, there's a small group of us, but most people don't get technology. Then I go to California, I do do a bit of fundraising in my job, uh, and in California, people are just completely either blind to or impatient with or dismissive of policy, politics, and process. It's messy. It's complicated. You have to compromise. It's slower than they want. But I want to say to them, guys, I'm sorry, right? You cannot fix all these problems just with technology. In the end, it's human behavior. It's the clash of interests. Don't tell me there are no politics in, you know, I'm watching Silicon Valley, the sitcom, like everybody else. You're really going to pretend there's no politics? That's ridiculous. There's the clash of human interest, and there will always be the clash of human interest. So we need to do both. We need to get more technologists into government for sure, but we also need to teach the mindset and the understanding of why politics, process, policy are in fact as, as essential to making true and lasting change as a wonderful technological solution. So with those preliminary thoughts, I'm going to turn it over to Alan Davidson, who's the moderator uh, of our panel. Alan is the new, I love saying this, uh, the, the, the director <laughs> of the, he's the director of the Open Technology Institute and the vice president for technology policy and strategy uh, here at New America. Uh, and he is not only focused on what OTI does, but how we link what OTI does to every other part uh, area of our policy. And he is going to introduce our panel and I get to sit and listen. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for that, uh, that excellent introduction and overview of the issue. And uh, welcome to everybody. Thanks for coming out uh, early on a, a very non-techy time in Washington. But we're glad to have you all here and to have everybody out uh, on the web watching. And uh, I'm Alan Davidson. I'm uh, the director of the Open Technology Institute here at the New America Foundation. I'm also a co-founder of the MIT Information Policy Project, which is co-sponsoring this event. And in fact, this is the first event in Washington that the new Information Policy Project at MIT has uh, co-hosted. So we're very excited to uh, be arriving in that way. So uh, thank you. And um, I will say, it's, it's, uh, this is a topic near and dear to my own heart. Uh, Emory has laid out a lot of the, the big issues. But we're, very, uh, we're lucky to have this report now at this time. Uh, this is an issue that a lot of us have been pondering for a while. Uh, but recent events uh, have really underscore the challenges that the government has in uh, dealing with technology and producing technology for the citizenry. And uh, we have, at this moment, an excellent report that gives us uh, a framework to think about these issues. Uh, the Future of Failure Report, sponsored by the Ford and MacArthur Foundation, uh, produced by the Friedman uh, Consulting Group, and that's going to be our topic for discussion today. It finds, uh, after talking with many of the experts in the field, some of whom are here today, uh, that in fact there is, there is a gap. There is a talent gap that we have to address in attracting, uh, as it says, a technologically oriented human capital uh, <laughs> to government. 
uh, and civil society, and that there are really serious issues that we need to deal with that are ramifications of that talent gap. Uh, at the same time, it does give us a glimmer of hope uh, that there are models for attracting this kind of talent and for having the kind of conversation that Anne-Marie talked about, uh, that it's a two-way conversation between the technological community, as it were, and those of us who work in civil society and in government. Um, I would say that uh, the report is a little bit heavy on talking about information technology, although I think a lot of the lessons that it uh, underlines are broadly applicable. We can talk about other kinds of technology and government. But I'd say there's actually a good reason for that, and that is probably because um, there's probably no other area right now where the pace of change is so high and where um, the, uh, the issues are so squarely presented to, to all of us. And um, if you look at the pace of change in technological adoption, it's incredible how it is accelerating. I mean, if you look at the, um, the it, took, it took 55 years for the automobile to reach a quarter of the US population. Um, telephone took 35 years. Television took 26 years. The PC took only 16 years. And the web took less than six years to reach a quarter of the US population. If you think about that trend, it actually seems to be continuing. Think about how quickly so many of people are adopting social networking, Wi-Fi, um, uh, you know, wearable computing. Uh, you know, what's next, right? I know, got the Fitbit. Um, so, and and we are that pace of change. The reasons for it, the underlying technology trends behind it, seem to point to a continuing, if anything, increase in this pace of change, and that raises huge issues for how we react to it, how we as a society make decisions about the technology uh, that's changing our world. So with all that as a backdrop, I would say we have an all-star lineup today uh, to help us think about these issues. And uh, let me introduce them. I'll start to my left. Uh, Susan Crawford is a visiting professor at Harvard Law School. She's uh, a professor of law at the uh, Benjamin Cardozo School of Law. Uh, and among her many claims to fame uh, uh, in terms of being here, she was President Obama's uh, first special assistant to the president for science, technology, and innovation policy. Maybe the only one. I don't know. There have been others. Um, broke the mold. Broke. Um, <laughs> Uh, but she has seen this from inside government and outside. She's most recently uh, the author of a book, um, uh, Captive Audience, on the telecom industry. Uh, to her left is uh, Dan Tag uh, Tangerlini, who uh, is currently the administrator of the Gen uh, US General Services Administration, GSA, as we affectionately know it. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Dan has a, uh, a long and distinguished career in the federal government and also in city government. He did uh, some senior posts, had some senior posts at the Treasury Department, uh, but was also the Washington, D.C. city administrator and deputy mayor. So we bring both of those perspectives, which we appreciate. And to his left is Ashkan Saltani, an independent uh, researcher and consultant who has uh, uh, been working on privacy and security issues uh, in the public eye quite a bit lately. Uh, he's, uh, was the main consultant for the Wall Street Journal's uh, What They Know uh, series on internet privacy, which was highly regarded. And uh, he's done a lot of work uh, on the Washington Post coverage of the, uh, uh, the Snowden affair. So uh, with this line of, and I should say, we're going to be joined by Tom Khalil, uh, who is currently the Deputy Director for Policy at the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, a senior advisor for science, technology, and innovation in the National Economic Council, did a uh, similar tour of duty in the Clinton administration, and has just been one of the really thoughtful, long-time uh, uh, people in government who've been watching this whole issue of, and working on this issue of how we get technologists and into government. So we've got this all-star cast. So let me start by just posing a general question to the group, which is, um, well, this report uh, says that we've got a problem, uh, that in fact there is this uh, lack, this talent gap in government. Um, let's just start by kind of testing the assumption. Uh, do you all agree that we have this gap, um, and is it a big problem? Susan, why don't I start with you? Well, we're here this morning. Right. So there's a problem. <laughs> OK, so we're the, we're the converted. We're the yeah, con in fact, we're probably speaking to the wrong people, because everybody here already understands that there's a giant gap between the affordances of technology, what's possible using it in policy and in the operations of governance and in making civic life richer, and the people inside 
they're heroes inside, people like Dan and Ashkan, who, are, who understand this and who are trying to move tech from a ministerial position, oh, those are the machines that someone else runs, right. into a seat at the table in policy making and in making people's lives better. Uh, and there are lots of ways that this report suggests we could build a pipeline of talent. But it's going to require lots of stages. I've got another book advertisement. I just finished with <laughs> Steve Goldsmith a book called The Responsive City, which talks about the need to, with strong leadership, especially in, in cities, and uh, bringing the millennials in and empowering government employees and using technology to carry forward and implement uh, technological and policy change, we're at this inflection point, a very interesting point in the history of governance, using technology and uh, being more responsive to citizenry that may actually enrich and thicken democracy. So it's a great opportunity, and we're at risk of losing it because of the internal structures and obstacles and uh, perception barriers where people think it couldn't possibly be engaging to work inside. So that's our problem. And I've got lots of ideas about how we might fix this, but I really want to hear from Dan and Ashkan. Yeah. So I'm not sure how to follow that, uh, <laughs> other amen. than to say amen. Yes, exactly where I testify. Uh, but uh, I, I think it's interesting. If I could pick up on the idea of cities, I think yeah. you're going to see a lot of innovation coming out of cities because there is this uh, uh, direct political effect of not getting it right. Mm -hmm. And you talked about a, an inflection point. We're an inflection point in the way services are delivered in general and people's expectations of how services are delivered and how people go to market, receive goods. And so um, government service is, is there's going to be a demand for people to receive government service in the way they can receive almost any other service. The always on, uh, always available uh, possibility of receiving service. I think in the federal government, it's a little harder. You, you're a little more removed yeah. in terms of your operations, your service delivery from that political imperative. Uh, and so it's, there's going to be some uh, need that's going to come from the local through the state government up to the federal government where the expectation of uh, government services delivered through technology is going to really put pressure on us. In the meantime, you know, we're struggling with the ability to deliver the, the basic services that, we, that we're required to deliver. Demand is not going down, but resource constraint is, is coming way up. The possibility of being more efficient and effective in delivering the services by leveraging smart technology is very clear, it's very there, but how do you get it? How do you go out and actually make the connection between your desire and the result? And that's through smart people who know actually how to do it. It's through technologists. The problem is who do you ask in an organization that hasn't invested in, in those folks and has difficulty attracting them? You know, Ashkan, uh, that's a great discussion of the kind of government services angle, but there's another piece to this, which is also the question of how we as a deliberative democracy have real conversations about technology. Now you've been deep in the weeds on the national conversation right now about the NSA and government surveillance generally. How do you see the issues around the technology pipeline playing into our ability to have a good debate about that or do good oversight of it? Absolutely, so I think um, you know, one, one of the things to think about is, uh, and I think Anne Marie hit it on the head, is culturally um, we're starting to see this kind of rapid development towards technical infrastructure and the use of technology to deliver services. Um, but there's, you know, on many regards, we saw that with phones and with roads and with other kind of infrastructure, te technical infrastructure, but we didn't call them like rodologists or, you know, <laughs> like, like, you know, we didn't call, you know, we, we, there were, we just ob observed that there was a technical development and that um, it was important to know how infrastructure works in that context, but not to kind of um, separate it. And I will say there's definitely a skill divide, but part of, I think, the value of um, technical minded people is the ability to demystify what the actual technology is and bring it back to key kind of um, societal democratic or, or, or whatever your political bend is, um, kind of key societal conversations and processes about the core factors, some of which might be technical if you're talking about infrastructure and scale, but some of it might just be around um, other values that we have in the ecosystem that you can just openly debate. And I think, so to, to, to frame it as technologists and non-technologists, I think does a disservice to understanding that it's just developing technical literacy. And there's people in the audience, you know, lawyers and uh, other civil, that, that have technical understandings that might be uh, 
so need, need to be supported and nurtured and developed as well. So at the, I worked at the FTC as well, and we had a handful of lawyers that were Silicon Valley background, and they were fantastic. They weren't referred to as uh, technologists, but you would ping them, and they would be able to, they, they knew enough to how like the web works or how, you know, I worked on the privacy issues, so like how cookies worked or how browsers worked, to really engage. And then you could have a technical person solve that 20% you know, kind of in the weeds part, but you could still kind of foster a good debate by just not um, making technologists or technology like this religious thing where you have to be a priest to understand it, but really just like it's a bunch of, you know, it's a bunch of technical issues and you sh you, here's what you need to know. Um, here's some important bits. Let me know if you have questions, mm -hmm. you know. Kind of framing it that way I think helps. Why is it hard? I mean, I guess, you know, to, f to find people who can do this. Um, well, I want to announce the era of the hyphenate. So there will be many more people in the future who are cross-trained as having this literacy and being aware of policy and process and politics, what Anne-Marie talked about. Right now it's hard because the funnels going in don't reward hyphenates. <laughs> you know, you're either an economist or you're the IT guy. No one seems to recognize, or a few people, there are enlightened people throughout government. We're not dumping on them, but it's <laughs> rare to find an HR process or an intake process that recognizes that hyphenates are everywhere, especially among millennials, and need to be encouraged and felt that they, they will have an impact. I think Dan's mention of being able to see the impact right. of your work on life is extraordinarily important. Everybody's looking for a meaningful life. And technologists, hyphenate policy people, want to be seen as uh, having a seat at the table. But we have to be able to create the processes that allow that seat to be created. But, but I think those systems and processes have been developed and iterated over many, many years. Right. And they've gained a certain um, protection around it. Yes. You, you described it right in your opening remarks. We're talking about the web's adoption took six years. And, and it was about six years ago. Right. Uh, you know, the, right. the PC's adoption took 16 years, and that was maybe you know, 26 years ago. And so we have systems that frankly don't reflect the pace of change. Right. And um, it's very You're hard. You're saying they then. can't keep up. It, it's almost as if they can't keep up. It's almost like the answer to this is uh, technology, but that's too meta uh, for <laughs> even a, a group like well, this to swallow. It's so very appealing for the Silicon Valley. Well, I think so, but, I, I, but how do you actually then get people who are willing to adopt it in a smart way uh, think about tools that will actually help us solve the problem when you have this entire system and, and the, the various different equities it's designed to protect that you have to protect as well. Uh, I'd actually push back a bit and say that, um, so with the exception of, and we should kind of differentiate, say, developers, people who are like building healthcare.gov and that are doing database administration and kind of really, you know, again, building roads or building, you know, building uh, electrical grids. And the people that are making policy decisions and kind of trying mm -hmm. to engage in public policy issues that technology impacts, um, we should kind of notice that, y in fact, there you, you could support the people doing the work already. Right, and instead of kind of pushing back and saying these infrastructures are in place to promote a particular agenda or a particular pipeline, and it's not supportive of the the, the technical growth, you could just say that, um, in fact, you will just uh, allow the people that are in place to to engage on the technical issues, make some mistakes, um, kind of uh, try their best at um, kind of deciding on the issues and f get them basically put them put them in the deep water quickly. Um, s as the technology is evolving, kind of have them dive right in rather than kind of make it this very uh, thing that uh, people are reluctant to engage on, right? So members of Congress are a good example. They oftentimes, you rarely see it now on a House floor a technical conversation because no one wants to look, you know, no one wants to be the Internet is tubes guy, right? <laughs> like nobody wants to just, and he's actually, he was accurate, right? right? right. It's a bunch of tubes in some respects, but no one wants to be that guy. Yeah. And so no one's willing to um, kind of engage in debate, um, which is kind of silly. I think we're all trying to figure out what this new thing is. We all are trying to like figure out how our iPhones work, even the technologists. Right. I think the difference between technical-minded people is they'll butt their head against the, the wall on a new thing that they don't understand until they figure it out and they have that confidence to poke and hack and manipulate the technology. And I think that's a different culture than people that are in government that are, they need to have experience and process and understand. Well, Sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, isn't part of the solution to that uh, problem actually having 
coders and, and other highly technical people uh, working with those folks so that they can, in a very safe way, go down to the, you know, that smart uh, woman down in, you know, in on, the, in the other, on the other floor and say, okay, so how does this thing work before I talk about it? So I don't sound like right. a, a I mean, dummy. Yeah, and we had this. Then, right? We're still thinking of technology as a tool that implements policy. And what I'm hoping for is that we get way beyond that. That right. the, these things are deeply integrated, mm -hmm. and uh, you we can't no policy we want to adopt education, climate change, anything else can be divorced from deep integration with with technology. That's so tough. you need the high level people at the policy table who already are unafraid and already create leadership for uh, integrating technology in, into Has policy. it gotten better? I mean, the old story was, you know, the member of Congress who had never seen email before, who had never used the web before, didn't have a computer on their desk, and now, you know, the president's got a Blackberry, and members of Congress are tweeting, or at least somebody's tweeting <laughs> on their behalf. Um, I'm not sure it's gotten that much better, actually. Okay. I mean, there's still a perception that uh, there's a screen in front of me, so the internet is broadcast. Things are being pushed at me, and a deep, fundamental lack of understanding that this is the permissionless world, that in fact, you ask for things and they are created by other people without permission. That very fundamental point is not known by members of Congress, that the internet is actually different from either broadcast or a phone system. So we still have a big education. We have a lot to do. And a lot of this has education, is uh, generational change, let's call it right. gently, as uh, just <laughs> you know, the demographic tide shift. It, this will happen. But we can accelerate the shift. That's, that's what I'm pushing for, especially in educational programs. And I, I really want to talk about what's going on at Harvard. And, um, and, and also bringing people, seconding people in from the private sector who can infuse the territory with this awareness every once in a while. And then leave. They can leave after a couple of years. But they, they go in. I'm getting a, a deep don't do that uh, head, head <laughs> shake. <so. laughs> um, how much of this is cultural? I mean, C.P. Snow t and Anne Marie right. Slaughter have both talked about the, uh, the divide, this cultural divide. And Ashkan, you said, you know, you use the words, let people make some mistakes, yeah. right? We don't seem to have a real culture of risk taking um, or mistake making tolerance in government. And that's very much a part of the technological approach that we see from a lot of people. How, how big an issue is it, beyond that even, how, how big an issue is culture in all of this in terms of attracting people, yeah, I mean, attaining I, them? I think culture is the kind of the biggest issue. In fact, I think Anne Marie mentioned it. I, I had mentioned that, you know, 9 a.m., you know, or the fact that um, <laughs> this sounds silly to most folks, um, mm -hmm. but like, you know, wearing jeans. I know New America, you can't wear jeans, right? Like, um, uh, I was told, like, I, like it's, uh, you've it's heard it now. Okay. Yeah. 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 As of today, no, as of today, we had such a policy. We do wear jeans, except when we're moderating panels. Sure, right. sure. Right. But I mean, it's like the fact of just culturally, you know, like, yeah. in some respects, um, it's sad, but technologists are kind of these these are not technologists, but developers. In this case, we're talking right. about developers, but they're kind of these artist types that work on their own hours and kind of dive into things deeply and don't like the kind of bureaucratic um, uh, process. And, and some of it is, you know, little things like time and, and um, uh, you know, clothing and this kind of stuff. But some of it is also around, um, generally, I had some notes here about like, um, kind of language, for example, the use of language, the um, kind of uh, efficiencies, for example. Like when I worked at the FTC, I had to, you know, and I guess it's been long enough. I, I, like, I stole my machine. I stole a machine that wasn't being used, formatted it, like, installed my tools, tethered it to the, and that's how I did my research, because it took six months for me to get my research lab set up. And like, there's just no, and so I would just work around the system. And so there's also the culture of just basically efficiency and like, um, you know, why would you do it that way? Because you could do it this way, and so bridging the culture of like understanding bureaucracies, understanding um, that DC works at a different pace, understanding that um, the language for things are different. We're, we're talking about the same thing. I think those issues, and and one final point, which I think for me in DC at least I've, I've observed is um, both in government and civil society, um, the lack of kind of community, right? So mm -hmm. each NGO has one geek. 
in house, okay. right? And yeah. I organize this. If like, they're lucky, right? right. They're lucky. If they're lucky, and I organize a happy hour, which is kind of like bringing together a bunch of the pol it's like the tech policy crowd, and people are starved for mm -hmm. kind of interaction and just water cooler talk and just uh, you know. Um, sharing notes and swapping ideas because in fact you know when I was at the FTC I know a bunch of other technologists here they're the one person at their shop that's the go-to kind of dictionary slash internet interface for the shop but they have no growth and no culture and no support yeah. internally as well sure. to grow and to learn more things and uh, other than the policy stuff but in their own technical community with their own vocabulary so I think that's another cultural mm -hmm. piece too how much of this is also um you know, we've, we've sort of jumped to the sort of what it's like to actually be in these spaces for the people who are either hyphenated or actual developers or technologists. How much of this is even just about how we uh, get this group of these people who have this combination of talents? I mean, is there a, is there a training issue here as well, um, just in terms of people's exposure to these issues? You know, we're talking about the people who've shown up to be that one that one technologist in the community or the set of people who are working within GSA to think of innovative solutions. Right. How do we even, you know, does that pool exist out there? Do you feel like it's growing? So I, I think at some level we have to recognize a lot of this stuff is still so new mm -hmm. that there's right. going to be a, an inherent scarcity to mm -hmm. the people who are really good at this stuff, particularly the deeply um, technical, uh, the, the coders, the, um, the engineers. Right. Um, the unhyphenated. The, uh, the well, or, or even, you know, heavily weighted towards one half <laughs> of the hyphenation. Right. So the question then is, how do you attract those folks mm -hmm. who can begin to develop a critical mass right. within your organization? You're right. If everyone's walking in and going into their, you know, designated office in a suit and everyone has to play the, the role according to the, uh, uh, you know, the bureaucratic uh, cultural established norms, it's kind of hard to get someone past the first visit. Right. Never mind then a process, a hiring process that may take three, four, five, six months. Right. They've and moved on. And the alternative is like foosball tables, sure. bicycles, and free exactly lunch. Right. Right. And, and right. I don't know if foosball tables, if someone's like, I'm going there because they have a right. foosball table. Right. Yeah. Right? Right. You know, and if, if that's the quality of the decision making, then maybe there is a big gap. Sure. <laughs> but, uh, but I want to go there because there's a really meaningful mission. There's something important they're doing. There's some way I can make a contribution. Right. And it might be worth you know, wading my way through whatever hip deep swamp of bureaucracy and challenge, you know, um, that, that might be worth it. Yeah, right. So there are a couple of big policy problems. One of them is civil service reform. Another is a procurement reform. These are huge problems for cities and the federal government right. to so make other sure. Than that, yeah, other no than that, we're done. Okay. Right. We're right. Done. But, but these, all these things have to be worked on in parallel. You can't have these, these people coming in, attracted to a culture, you do your best, and then they get slammed by the right. various processes that keep them in their place. These wonderful systems were put in place, and here comes the hero, Tom Khalil. All right. <laughs> right on cue. <laughs> <laughs> My schedule would have worked if I could teleport. <laughs> I thought you could. I thought people are working on that. <laughs> We're just talking about fixing right. everything, Tom. Right. Good. Uh, well, but we've moved to the we've moved to your sweet spot, which is the solution space. Right. So, but so maybe that's a good segue. But I, okay. To what you're okay. Talking so about. I want yeah. to finish off fixing all, all the policies, and right. then. So I want to tell you what, what's going on at Harvard. So tell us what's going again on at with the cities, I really believe with, with Dan that cities are places where civic has meaning, where people can see the impact of their activities. And I've had been very privileged over the last few years to set up a very good relationship with City Hall. And they're delighted to have meaningful projects being done by design school students, Kennedy School students, Harvard Law School students. These are real projects, not make work, because they don't have the resources to, right? And urban then, mechanics. Well, that's a start. And they're yeah. wonderful people, the urban yeah. mechanics. They, yeah. They're working on it. But it's the strong leadership of the mayor mm -hmm. then drives these, these projects into reality. Here's the next thing we need to do. These students are all excited about working in local government. We need to create ways for them to do that in a kind of a Peace Corps two-year way. I want to call them the last mile fellows mm -hmm. because they're mm -hmm. going to come in and actually implement the projects that they started working on as students and get it done and do the cross-agency work that's required. This, and this can come, we need money for this, it has to come from the philanthropic sector, also from the private sector. Get these people in so that they already know that serving in government is an honorable thing. They've now learned that in graduate school. Get them the time to, to experience it, and then go back out and spin in another time. Um, 
as we're sort of turning to this thinking about the solution space, mm -hmm. Dan, you've got this 18F group right. that right. is working in GSA. Can you tell us a little about that and we'll, whether it's... Well, think about model. all those challenges you just described about the bureaucracy as code. Mm -hmm. right? right? Why not get some smart people who know how to code to help you hack that and okay. understand how you can maybe take the thing that you already have and find better and smarter ways to get it to produce different results. While we're waiting for civil service reform and procurement reform, and I've been working <laughs> in government in some form for 23 years and I'm waiting, um, <laughs> I think the trick is it's really the responsibility of leaders and managers and all of the employees to say, well, wait a second, is there some other way to get to the same outcome? And so that's what we're trying with, with 18F. We're trying to develop capacity, build some, uh, build some critical mass so that we can have a better understanding of how we go to market and buy this stuff. We have a place where people can actually try things, build a minimal viable product and give it a shot. And frankly, part of the, um, the really exciting part is figure out how you build something, how you build a startup within the context of something as big and complicated and well-established as the federal government. Um, Tom, do you have uh, ideas that you can share with us about what's going on right now to address this? You've been, you've been working in this for well, through two <laughs> democratic administrations for the last right. 20 years almost. Yeah, so a, a couple things. One is that um, one program that we started a couple of years ago is called the Presidential Innovation Fellows. Right. Uh, this, this is something that our CTO, uh, Todd Park, started. Uh, and lest you think uh, there is any lack of interest in this, for 18 positions, we got 1,200 applications. Wow, so great. this is more competitive than the IVs. Uh, and uh, so what are you doing there, with the leftovers? Uh, some of us talk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. So there, there is, I mean, we actually do ask them, you know, if you can't become a presidential innovation fellow, would you also be interested in being considered for other positions? So, right. so and the other exciting thing is that some of them show up uh, intending to do a short t tour of duty and then stay. Mm -hmm. uh, so a good example of this is uh, one, of, one of the PIFs is now the chief technology officer of the Veterans Administration mm -hmm. uh, and is going to be recruiting another class uh, of PIFs to help uh, round out her team. So I think a couple things. One is that we have a tendency to have this sort of binary view, uh, which is that either you are a political appointee and a you know presidentially appointed, mm -hmm. Senate confirmed, uh, someone like the honorable administrator of the you know, GSA, a big right. deal, or you are a, a civil servant who's going to work in the federal government uh, for 30 years, and that is not everyone's cup of tea. Um, and what we find that some of the most innovative organizations within the federal government uh, explicitly recruit people for a short period of time. So if you are at DARPA, uh, your tour of duty is typically four years, and you have an expiration date on your badge. Uh, and that gives you a certain amount, uh, that gives you a sense of urgency because you are, you know you are not going to have the ability to be at this amazing organization indefinitely. You have a short period of time. You're only, so fresh, I, you're only fresh until 2016 or <laughs> right, something Right, exactly. Like that, right? So I think that if, uh, and we, the federal government actually has a lot of tools to bring in people for what we call term appointments, right? Uh, a year or three years or four years. And so um, I think that we could do a fair amount, A, uh, by using those authorities more expansively, and B, uh, doing a better job of publicizing all the amazing change the world opportunities that exist uh, within the federal government. Uh, so I think those two things uh, would make a, a, a big difference. And, you know, Dan, you, you, in addition to all the innovative stuff that's going on at GSA and in the federal government, you've actually seen this from the city government point of view. I mean, how well did some of these things scale at that level? Is this going to be something that cities can really do as well? Or, I mean, we've oh, done I, a lot I, of Again, cities. I still think that what we're doing is we're chasing cities to yeah. some extent in, um, in understanding the possibility that uh, you know finding ways to really recruit people in either for a day through you know um, civic hack uh, right. hacktivist festivals um, uh, through um, challenges 
uh, and then through programs like the one you're talking about, which right. sounds exactly like the PIFs, actually. Mm -hmm. So that sounds like uh, some chance to come to back down to the uh, city government. Um, I, I really think that uh, the big question is the one that Tom was raising is, what are the tools that we actually have available to build right. enough critical mass mm -hmm. within the federal government that other people can begin to build the, um, the community, that they can begin to teach each other how you actually um, begin to overcome some of these uh, things that people think are very tall hurdles. Mm -hmm. right. um, because it's, it's mainly oral right. tradition. It's not actually <laughs> right. a law. It's oral tradition and guerrilla warfare a lot of the time. Right. And you, we want to find a way to systematize and just make it part of the water. That this, this is right. how things get done in ways. Um, can I sorry, raise yeah, yeah, no, please, issues? go yeah. ahead. Yeah. So I think that as we think about this, uh, another key area is how do we uh, build up uh, uh, interdisciplinary individuals and teams that are, are facile both with the technology and who have a deep domain expertise mm -hmm. in, in a particular application. Right. Um, and so an example is uh, what, what are the opportunities to transform the way teachers teach and students learn using technology? Uh, I think there are huge opportunities, but there are also uh, major barriers as well. So you know, if we look at the market for educational software, for example, we have 15,000 different school districts. Uh, we have lengthy adoption cycles. Uh, so we're, we're not getting the sort of private sector investment that we would like. So we need people who can say, all right, what will it take to uh, uh, create markets for learning software that is as compelling as the best video game uh, that improves the more students use it and is as effective as a one-on-one -on -one tutor. Um, so those are the types of aspirations that we should have for technology to help address major societal challenges. And in some cases, uh, you know, changes in, in policy, uh, in investments in research are going to be required, and we need the uh, the people who can help uh, drive those initiatives at a, a national, uh, regional, and, and local level. Well, I mean, even just listening, though, even articulating those aspirations, right. even mm -hmm. thinking up those aspirations mm -hmm. requires people who have a good intuition about mm -hmm. the possible, right? Right, right. and, and I, just, I, I yeah. want to support the role of the leadership for this, that having someone who can speak for the agency and for the program and say, this, these are the aspirations, is also extraordinarily important. That all our band of fellows and workers and hyphenates needs people at the top who can uh, support what they're up to. Yeah, I was just going to echo that. If you, if you go to TechCrunch Disrupt and just say that, I suspect you know, next, uh, in six months, you'll have a bunch of um, potential startup ideas around it and uh, potential innovative models that try to experiment on those topics. I think a lot of it is communicating what the needs are and what the narrow path is. Like everyone knows how to, you know, or not everyone knows, but it's commonly known how to go from, say, a startup to a company in, in California, but it's not known how to go from a prototype to, uh, you know, implementation in a small city uh, on educational software. And so right. just kind of someone that knows how to navigate and there's a pitch of what the needs are and communicates those needs, I think, um, is also a huge opportunity. But this, this does come back to then some of those fundamental challenges right. you raised about these business processes, systems, and structures that inhibit the ability for us to connect, you know, great ideas that are frankly possible uh, with the uh, technology we have. And, um, and then the, you know, so the grant making process, the, or the procurement yeah. process, and how do we actually find enough interest to wade back into that, that, that part of the value chain where not a lot of people want to go and spend a lot of time mm -hmm. and uh, figure out ways that we can in, improve those systems and processes so that there can be the, the connection between that great idea and, um, and the policy implementation. Uh, I mean, I've seen this work not in government per se, but I've seen this work around government in two areas. One is around um, kind of uh, zero day vulnerability development uh, and development of. Can you say what that is, really? Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. uh, cybersecurity software, um, both for attacking and for protection, um, around a conference that happens every year called Black Hat and DEF CON. And, um, in Las Vegas. In Las Vegas. Right. Um, but there was a program by the government to essentially fast track. Um, grant making for research projects in cybersecurity, 
and it was, you know, this was the cyber fast track initiative. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Yep. And so it allowed a developer or, or, or a researcher like myself to quickly get something like fifty grand for a year to de to look into. Um, some critical software vulnerabilities, and it worked very well. I think it got put, and it, it would fast track both the government process as well as the clearance process. Or M Mudge did this. Mudge did this. Yeah. yeah. So um, he was, you know, ha from this community that became a one-star general randomly, which was kind of awesome. But, um, <laughs> so that's one. The other one that I've seen that's working really well is this um, scholarship for service, um, basically the Cyber Corps program, where you can essentially. Um, go to schools that teach a very specific type of, again, cybersecurity um, kind of tuition and uh, a curriculum, and you can essentially um, have your tuition covered for the time that you attend school if you go to a federal agency um, or you know federal-related agency like MITRE um, or you know research group. Uh, and do that kind of work. Now, this is for offensive cyber research. So this is like developing weapons and and developing. You know, the, the companies that are recruiting here are the NSA's and the MITRE's and the um, CIA's um, trying to develop cyber capability. But the the model is is, is is sound, which is like you. We'll teach you some cool things that you should learn, and we'll um, pay for your tuition if you come to government and apply those things. And so I think that's also a, a good model to think about. Mm -hmm. um, We've talked a lot about government. Uh, one of the things that the report also talks about is civil society and uh, the public interest community and how it fills its needs. Um, you know, Ashkan or Susan, you, you work very close. Well, all of you guys probably work closely. I know Tom, you work closely with a lot of civil society groups. What do we do about building capacity there? How do we attract the kind of talent, uh, whether it's hyphenated or otherwise, into that community? Well, it doesn't seem as if there's an enormous appetite for this. I mean, the, right. the students that I run to. They don't trust government. They would rather work for civil society. And uh, they have these skills. They just want to be confident that they'll be paid. If they have student debt, they want to be able to pay it back. They want to be confident that they won't run into a sort of desultory life because the nonprofits aren't actually having an impact. So, but if we can identify and advertise, this is the advertising point that Dan's making, make sure that everybody understands these jobs are out there and right. how much fun they are. And that they're well paid. I think that actually there's an enormous number of people well who want to serve. Well paid may vary, but right. yeah, yeah, well paid is a problem. Right. Well right. paid is a problem. But good missions. Good, mission, right. mission is. And everything. that's true in government and in civil society. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Ashkan, do you have anything? Yeah, I mean, so the challenge is, so it's um, usually not well paid. Usually, um, kind of not a uh, lot of career growth on, growth on the, the technical side yeah. and not a lot of um, community, as we said. Right. So then what's the draw? Similar challenges to what we're facing. Right. Yeah. And so the question is, what's the draw? And so the draw is potentially things like convincing uh, people of impact, mm -hmm. um, kind of educational different respects. Really, you're going to find the people that go to these roles are first and foremost interested in whatever the kind of NGO or civil society goal outcome is or will be, and and the technology side second. So they're just coming, and so you have to connect with those people because it's really hard to have another. I don't I don't see for, uh, it's very hard to draw that talent to these orgs to say like come and come to our twenty person shop and be our 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 tech guy, um, and on a really important issue. But like do you know rather than all these other opportunities, right? Sounds like the, the challenge is the same in the government. You right. need to convince right. folks that they're not just a bolt-on, mm -hmm. that they're not going right. to be a mechanic, yep. uh, they're not going to be sitting downstairs with the boiler, that Absolutely. they're actually going to be part of the, the process. Yeah, of yeah I'm sorry. And they can make a difference. If I, right. I didn't, if I didn't clarify, yeah, that's absolutely mm -hmm. um, one of the key. So again, we've, we've talked about, I've seen a number of even um, kind of centers at various universities kind of speak of, yes, we're, we want more technologists. And what they mean is we want developers to implement Right. Some great great idea the lawyer had. We, we wanna, <laughs> and they're like, we want to do the next verdict, and so we have a great idea, and you should come and build it for us. And that's a very different thing than saying like, come participate, help us shape what we do, help us identify the important issues. That and that's also another a problem. Thing. That remains a problem, absolutely. As opposed to make sure my email works. Yeah. <laughs> right. 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 Yeah. Um, that's a different uh, different question, which is. Um, Diversity is a huge issue already within the, within the technical community, the STEM community. You know, how do we work to improve diversity even as we build this capacity in government and in civil society? 
I recently gave a talk to the computer science department at Harvard, and there was one woman in the room. I, I don't know how that works. I it seems to me we have these deep problems with gender diversity that we have to right. take on from the earliest age, starting in junior high school, high school, get just get everybody uh, seeing themselves as potential future engineers. Um, racial diversity is also an enormous problem. Th these problems seem so baffling that I'm, I'm going back to net neutrality. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> we can talk about that too. No. <laughs> we'll pick an easy problem. Yeah, how much of this is, is self-reinforcing? Yeah. Where are the right. good examples and good role models? Um, and my, we haven't done a great job on our panel. Yeah. Right. Um, right. My 14-year-old daughter, though, has been able to you know, gain some interest in this through um, going online and using Code Academy. Yeah. Right. And I'm wondering if we can begin to break down the barriers and make it something that can happen in the safe zone and say, hey, I, I'm actually good at this, or I like this, this is fun, mm -hmm. and find a way that it is less kind of um, maybe initially institutional ba right. institutionally based, and then they can pursue curiosity. Yeah. Yeah. And I would, I would say, it's this, we kind of touched on it earlier, it's the same problem of um, getting kind of lawyer types and government engaged, right? It's, it's taking it out of the... Um, kind of technical weeds and saying this is, like I can frame a, 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 a technical issue in a way where you, all of your eyes will glaze over and no one will have an opinion or want to engage or, or have any thoughts on it. Or I can take the same technical issue and provide it in a way that, you know, kind of appeals to you, you might have an opinion on, you might actually have some expertise on. And, and um, being able to do that, I think, will, will engage people that would normally feel reluctant to, to dip their toe in, they would say it's this scary thing or that right. there's no reinforcement for me to try it or experiment. And I think both from non-expertise as well as uh, kind of diversity issues, you just want to bring people in and, and make them realize this, this is like, we're not talking about super technical things here. We are in some sense, but we're also talking about kind of the fundamental issues that you care about right. uh, and you have language for and you have great expertise on, you should just engage and not be afraid to engage. I want to open it up for questions in the audience, but maybe I'll just ask one last blanket question for the panel, which is, is there anything else in the solution space that we should be thinking about that we haven't touched on yet? That uh, um, There's a lot that's in the report, but if there's anything else that's leaping out here that we've, we've missed in terms of low-hanging fruit or otherwise. Yeah, Tom. <coughs> so w one of the ways in which the government uh, creates a specialized workforce is that it invests in research, particularly university research. So uh, the, you know, what happens when a professor gets a grant is that they recruit uh, graduate students and postdocs to do the vast majority right. of the work. Uh, and so you know, that's why, for example, we have a huge uh, workforce right. in the area of biomedical research. And so one of the things I, I think we have to start thinking about is that we have some agencies that have vast capacity to do that which is why we have a specialized workforce in those areas. And we, we have other agencies, um, you know, particularly those that work on domestic issues and issues right. related to social justice and poverty alleviation that have almost zero capacity to do that. And so I think that's one, one of the reasons why uh, we don't have uh, some of these communities. Well, I, I should just say, as somebody who works part-time in a center uh, that's trying to build uh, capacity in this area, we would welcome more federal <laughs> research <laughs> dollars. Right. Uh, <laughs> and actually, that, uh, the meta point here yes, is sir. that universities are platforms for exactly this kind of development. And universities are incumbents that are threatened by the advent of technology, just like everybody else. And they've got silos, just like the government agencies do. And finding ways to help universities to see themselves at the nexus of public and private interests developing this capacity seems genuinely fruitful and it's very rarely happening these days. There are some policy schools that have deep interactions with the public sector, not a lot. Some also try to bring in a few random token technologists, not a lot. This could be much more intentional and spread across the country in ways that would be extraordinarily helpful. And foundations could play an important role in that. Yeah. I mean, Rockefeller, the Rockefeller Foundation created the discipline of molecular biology. Mm -hmm. right. uh, Whitaker played a critical role in creating the discipline of biomedical engineering. Uh, and you know, what one could imagine foundations playing a similar leadership role in this area. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, we've got hands in the audience, many <laughs> hands. Um, why don't we start in the back? Uh, well, in the middle back. David Robinson. Hi. Uh, such an important conversation and so glad that uh, we're having it. I, so just by way of 
introduction, or I, I want to point out a kind of a pattern that I've seen that I think is important that cuts across OTI and 18F and, and what I do, which is a small public interest focused tech expertise uh, consulting firm, which is that not only is there an important sort of skill set for technologists, as Anne Marie said, uh, learning how policy works and learning how to engage, but the flip side of that coin, which I think is also very important, is the capacity of policy organizations to use technologists and to know oh, yeah. what kinds of value technologists can deliver. And I think that's been, there have been some real success uh, cases, as Alan said, when there have been senior people who kind of have the stature to come in and say, here's how technology can help you change the way you think about your policy problem. Uh, you know, like, for example, at the FTC, there have been a series of chief technologists who've had that role, which I think has been extremely productive. But I think it's, it's hard when you have somebody coming in at a more junior level into an organization not accustomed yeah. to this kind of innovative activity where that person may not have the stature within the perception of, of the organization that they are joining to realign how that organization thinks, thinks about these problems. And I actually think that's one reason why we've seen sort of centers of tech expertise that work across a number of different issues or different organizational units. And I, I, I would say that, um, that, that I think that's a, that's a model that's, that scales well because those organizations, like for example, OTI is developing this cross-disciplinary, cross vertical expertise in bringing technology into a policy area and then doing that in education and health and economics and, and so on. And I think that's a big part of the solution. Comments? Yeah, I think, uh, I think you actually, within that, you point out a very interesting point that for most, uh, most big uh, organizations, technology is, is operations right. and operations is risk, right? And, and you, you go there if you have to but remember, there be dragons, right? Uh, you, you don't know what's going to be on the other side uh, of the horizon line. And so by having, you know, part of what we're trying to do is through 18F is actually um, create an insurance policy that allows the organization, our organization and the organizations we work with, to say, okay, we can go and try it. We have people who are inside, who are on our side, who can help us figure out these problems. Um, build minimum viable products, teach us how to, to do this, uh, you know, approach problems in a different way before we go out in a big way and, and potentially, you know, have uh, a big problem. Uh, great panel, folks. Uh, uh, Stephen Levy from Wired. Uh, there's been some oblique references to uh, the people of the existing culture in terms of guerrilla warfare or the contracting infrastructure. <laughs> uh, could you be a little more explicit about those who may not actually want to change things and, and seem to be uh, in a, a pretty good position so far in actively resisting change or deflecting it um, as, as the current system works? Sure. When well, doing research for the Responsive City, I talked to lots of heroes in different city halls around the world. And basically, you can see this as tribal. There are different tribes inside City Hall who have their interests to protect and they have job security to hang on to and bureaucratic need to, to keep an issue inside their shop and not share. And so in order to break all that up, you have to have leadership at the top who understands that world, the world has to change and that technology is part of policy making, not divorced from it, not ministerial, and that the people who understand tech should be raised in the organization, should be given dignity and respect. So it's a big, it's just tribal warfare. And, it, and you have to have a chieftain who can beat heads and make sure that everybody else cooperates. I think the other issue is, is what is the incentive structure, right? So if you're in a situation where if you try something new and it goes poorly, that leads to right. GAO, IG, <laughs> Congressional right. Hearing, Washington Post. What? And if things go spectacularly <laughs> well. Not necessarily in right. that order. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, it, and if things goes, go, goes, uh, go well, there is not you know, the equivalent of equity or stock options. Right. Uh, yes. And so I, I, think, so I think another uh, important thing is um, to actively encourage uh, yeah. Re responsible risk taking yeah. right. uh, and to promote and celebrate uh, innovation. So one of the things that HHS does, for example, is 
that the, the secretary has a program called HHS Innovates, uh, where they s celebrate some of the most successful projects that civil servants have been working on. So I think that's, that's one of the things that's important. Do you think we'll be able to get to a place where we embrace or at least tolerate failure a little bit more? Or uh, that's a little yes. harder. <laughs> <laughs> okay, just say yes. Yeah. All right. I think the trick is uh, to make it uh, make the failures not the epic fail. Mm -hmm. You know, so right. figure right. out a way. Uh, right. uh, you know <laughs> that you could you could build it small and fail small and come back and fail see small. if you can move towards uh, succeeding big. But um, to Tom's point, our our budget director at GSA coined this great phrase about federal tech. The philosophy too often is if it ain't broke, don't make it better. <laughs> right? If the result, <laughs> if it's giving you the result, the problem is you miss generation after generation of, of upgrade and iteration. So what happens is the ability to then go back and, and fix it ultimately gets harder and harder because it becomes more and more ingrained into your business process. It becomes more and more expensive to pull all the data out. Right. And so um, what we need to do is figure out a way that we can more aggressively and continuously iterate and evolve particularly in an, in an environment where we're really reaping the kind of the midpoint of Moore's law here, where things are changing so dramatically so quickly. And, and culturally, like in terms of drawing talent or retaining talent, nobody wants to be the guy working on you know, Windows XP and 20-year-old technology. Exactly right. now, these are a culture of people that are drawn to innovation, to new technologies, to figuring out new things. And so if you're supporting some you know, ancient architecture or ancient infrastructure, and your job is on a day-to-day -day basis to be laughed at because you're like, you know, you're you're using punch cards, like, or using a floppy disk to, to do uh, nuclear launch codes. I don't know if you guys saw that. There's a like, <laughs> <laughs> right? It ain't broke. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Don't make it better. <laughs> Questions here. Hey, um, I think that there is one community that has been uh, left out of this conversation. And I think it speaks to some of the problems with the ACA, and that is the community of people who are, have difficulty actually accessing digital services. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we can talk about the digital divide, um, but it seems like in that conversation, those folks were something of an afterthought. Um, like, oh, wait a minute, people might not actually be able to get online and register for healthcare. I mean, I think it's important for two reasons. One is leadership, and the other is diversity. So, you know, in terms of leadership, um, what can we find in local communities in terms of people who understand the issues of those communities and how can these folks we're talking about in government and in civil society work better with local leaders and folks from the community, especially from underrepresented um, and underserved communities? And the other, in terms of diversity, um, unless we have per those perspectives in these conversations, like sort of the atmosphere is never going to be welcoming for those sure. folks. So I'd love it if some of you could speak to those issues. So I think that's where the, uh, the local government relationship yeah. is yeah. really so strong. So when I was working as a city administrator, we were very interested in that. We had a, we had a population in the city that actually had very high literacy, illiteracy rates. So it wasn't even just a digital divide, it was really a service divide. The trick is, and the question you have to ask yourself, is it possible through smart use of this technology that you can overcome some of those divides? And can you free up resources so that more resources can be pushed into closing that gap? So in that sense, what I, what I worry about is it becomes a, a fight between people who are actually advocating for the same outcome um, and about whether it should be digital or not digital rather than how do we deliver the full spectrum of services to people who actually need them. And I think in the ACA, actually, you saw you know, there were people actually physically out there signing up folks. Um, we, we needed to rely on them more, frankly, than we wanted to uh, because we, we didn't have the full capacity available initially through the digital side. And so the real trick is how do we, how do we um, maybe prevent ourselves from arguing with each other over issues that we are all committed uh, to delivering services and figure out ways that we can provide the full spectrum of services to people who need it. Up front. Hi, Frank Torres with Microsoft. You talked about the role of foundations in the government. I was wondering about what you think about uh, the role of the private sector in, in some of this. I mean, we can certainly encourage, and companies have encouraged, uh, you know, education to promote uh, science and technology and math in the schools to help build up 
you know, a crop of engineers um, emerging can certainly support fellows and NGOs and other places. But it seems like there's a, a gap between, you know, fostering, you know, more participation in the government, perhaps, you know, coming from the private sector in, in, in some of this. Well, it seemed to me that someone who has reached his or her mid-career point, they're feeling relatively confident in their job in private sector, should be given the opportunity to take a sabbatical of some kind and go in and spend a couple of years and then come back out. It, this, Tom can make it happen. He can make anything happen in the federal government. And, and cities, <laughs> you heard it here. Right, and right. cities can make it happen. It's just will and interest and um, suspension of fear to in encourage people. That's part of your career. That's part of your civic duty and fabric is, is to go in and, and come out with a newfound respect. It also helps people then be reminded they really need to upgrade those systems because right. it's embarrassing when this woman or man shows up and it feels so uncomfortable with what they're faced with. So I, I think that much more could be intentionally done along those lines. Oh, how about back there? Yeah. Hi, I'm Gwen Cost and I work for Dan. Um, <coughs> but I wanted to, uh, <laughs> I, full disclosure. Um, so he may not want to answer this question. The um, <laughs> okay. so we'll question I have though, later today. This so is your you chance. Ask it again. <laughs> <laughs> um, the question I have though, um, started, you all mentioned it in different types of ways, which is the ongoing challenge that we have in the big dogs of uh, procurement yeah. and HR. Yeah. And we talk about that as being a fundamental change. And I've only been in government for 10 years, so Dan laps me um, in that space um, by a long shot. But I was in the private sector. Uh, he doesn't let me in age. Um, and so my question is, how do we make those fundamental changes? I've been in government for 10 years. I've been frustrated for 10 years. I don't see it getting any better in 10 years. Because it's not going to be an easy fix. It's not going to be something we're going to be able to bolt on or, or make this yeah. quick change. So what are, and I don't, I don't, maybe it's touched on in the report, but what are we actually doing and what can we do to make an impact in this space? Because as far as I'm concerned, in 10 years, it has not gotten an inch better. So uh, I say frustration is actually a really great emotion because it means you can see a better future. You just haven't figured out how to get there yet. So as long as you're frustrated and not desperate, we're still good. <laughs> yeah, that's um, great. Yeah, so desperation, <laughs> call me before that you get there. <laughs> But um, I, I think the trick is um, to recognize that we need to continue to have this kind of dialogue and point out what those limitations are, but then not stop and say, well, I've got these limitations. I, I can't evolve. Um, and I frankly think that that's where, you know, to get back to this last question, that's where the partnership with business can come in. Uh, can business actually see the procurement system less as a protection of incumbency and more as an impediment to innovation? Right. And work with us to get the you know, political support necessary to go and maybe fight some of the bigger uh, fights associated with that. We also then need to find ways that we can break down the, the oral tradition barriers. You know, oh, you can't do that because it's against the law. And actually, you know, Not always partner true. up with the lawyers and say, why is it against the law? Help me understand. I mean, we found through 18F and, and having that group and, and uh, uh, allowing them to go and learn from the best practices of other agencies and develop some of their own that uh, some of these barriers that we, we took as insurmountable are actually more mythical than actual. <laughs> yeah, can I just build on that? So uh, there's a, a book on procurement uh, from a lieutenant colonel uh, by the name of Dan Ward called uh, FIRE, uh, which stands for Fast, Inexpensive, Restrained, and Elegant. And he does, everything he does, he's doing under uh, you know, the federal procurement laws as they exist, not as we wish they exist. Uh, and so a lot of it is, a, is about mindset. And he is uh, the only lieutenant colonel uh, that I know who is, who's done uh, comic books uh, to explain his approach. So we, we need to <laughs> lift people like that up who right. are you know, figuring out how to make it work in, in, the, in the current system and, and spread some of those approaches. Got about five minutes left. Do you want to go to the back there? And then we'll, we'll, move, we'll try and get through everybody real quick. So, Hi, this is Megan Gray. And I just think it's fantastic that folks are taking this issue head on. It is, is just going to be fantastic to see everybody address this directly and try to find solutions. On that point, having read the report, which I also thought was very, very well done and talked to some um, very insightful folks to collect the information and insights. But 
there were two points that I thought were missing in the report. One was that there was nothing discussing the clearance process. So mm -hmm. to go into government, especially uh, for the positions that require technology, it requires top secret, secret, uh, all sorts of different levels. And even just the, the, the most basic level to get into government is a, a trust level. And that is still very invasive. I think for most people to uh, fill out those forms and know that it's going to be more than just checking to see if they have a criminal record. I mean, it is really um, intimidating. So I was surprised that the solutions haven't addressed that uh, hurdle. And then the second point is this idea of conflict of interest. And I think the idea of having secondments is fantastic. That um, experience with how things work on the ground with companies <coughs> is incredibly helpful in government. But for a lot of these positions, you, once you've gone into government, you are conflicted out. You have a lifetime ban of going back to private sector and working on or working for a particular company. For example, I know that the FTC has had some problems getting technologists in because if the technologists are working on an investigation of, you know, a privacy um, issue for, you know, name any company, then that technologist who may be working on the investigation would then have a lifetime ban of going to work for that company. And that's a career altering change that most folks aren't going to want to take on. But so I wonder if the secondments um, can, can actually work in practice. And just one last uh, comment I'd love to get your feedback on is this idea of the revolving door. Because I think a revolving door is good, but we all know in DC that it has a very negative stigma. Um, so how do you address that? Yeah, commented on any of these. The well, once we fix re re procurement and civil service reform, <laughs> then, then clearance process is next. And, and I think these are all subspecies of the same problem. These things were set up for very good reasons, and they become overgrown with kudzu and vegetation. And they're just, you know, you can't hack your way through them. And they're getting in the way of effective and efficient government processes. So we have a lot to do. And, and some people will work through the process, as Tom's suggesting, and some will try to fix it. I, you know, I am hoping that the secondment idea can be done in a uh, context of a waiver from some of the conflict of interest rules. I understand that's really difficult. I just want to give you a counter story. I talked to some Harvard Business School professor who told me, if I don't have a conflict, I'm not interested. <laughs> I just want to <laughs> hand that to you. you know, that, that's the private sector view. No conflict, yeah. no interest. Right, <laughs> exactly. Uh, okay, how about we have <laughs> one back there and two in front, and maybe we can uh, do that, and then these two, and then we'll, we'll wrap. I can be quick. But, um, I'm Georgia Bullen from OTI. Uh, so one of the things I just, we've been talking about tech a lot, and actually one of my pet peeves as a designer in technology is that we talk about it as if tech can solve the problems. That's right. When in reality, we're actually talking about an ecosystem of people who work in technology. So I'm wondering if you guys can talk about that in your, we talked about it a little bit in the policy technology space, but we're not necessarily talking about what makes up the field of technologists. Uh, and that it's, if you guys could talk about that a little bit and how your teams work, maybe within 18F and um, OSTP, I think that would be really helpful for people to hear about. Well, I, I personally don't think that technology per se is a solution to any problem. I mean, yeah. re really you need to have some idea of what the outcome is and even just an idea. And I think smart technology then tests that idea uh, against um, you know, people's reaction and, 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 and whether you succeed or not. So it really comes back to a another area where we have a huge weakness actually in our, in our um, employee base, which is really um, an analytical ability, an analytical capability. So between the technologist, the coder who can write the code, the, the lawyer type uh, who can come up with the policy, there has to be you know, the, the analytical capability to understand whether you're actually having an impact or not. So part of what we're doing is um, less less trumpeted than 18F is building a, a data analytical capability within our Office of Government-Wide Policy. And we believe that between agency problem identification, the ability to go in and develop tools, and then the, the ability to evaluate the relative performance of those tools in solving that problem, we might actually have a virtuous cycle that will begin to better apply technology to our problems. 
So a good example of this ecosystem that you're talking about is the government uh, making more information available in bulk downloadable machine readable format, holding uh, data jams that encourage technologists and domain expertise to identify potential applications that could take advantage of that and solve real problems in areas like health. Uh, foundations like the Robert Wood Johnson uh, Foundation supporting the uh, Health Data Initiative. Uh, and then uh, companies and nonprofits actually developing these applications that have been identified. So you're absolutely <coughs> right that it really does take this uh, ecosystem of, of different players with different skills uh, to really create value. And just a really short answer. So the kind of both your question and part of Megan's question, I think, <coughs> comes down to just sophistic like sophistication in early days, right? So the, there's this general word technology or technologist that's kind of blanketed. So you, if you work on technology for Google, you're, you're for, forever conflicted from working on technology for Google, for example, or if you're a technologist, you do all of this technology magic stuff. I think as we get more sophisticated, we'll identify that there, it's siloed and there's specializations and there's design and there's user interface design <laughs> and there's da data analytics and there's a bunch of factors with regards to what it means to work with technology. And as that vocabulary develops, we'll, pro we'll, you know, we'll develop both conflict rules and we'll t titles and, and resource calls that are, that are more accurate and more um, kind of true to the nature of the work. And to respond to the pet peeve, this is all about humans. These stories are all about people. And so focusing on design and the human computer interface and just our relationship to this is also part of the ecosystem. And I'm very uh, attuned to that and very interested in, in broadening the conversation along those lines. OK, why don't we lightning round if you guys can both right. ask your question, and then we'll wrap. Hi. Yeah. Uh, excuse me. Hi, Joe Hall, Chief Technologist at CDT. Um, I, I have had a lot of success in teaching people about technology and sort of bringing people to the tech, bringing policymakers to the tech. The thing I've had, i um, continue to be frustrated by is teaching technologists about policy and, and trying to get them to care. And I remember taking a cyber law class in Berkeley in 2001 from Pam Samuelson. There were three computer science students in that class. We aced it. And those are the guys, it was three guys in this case, <laughs> that I know would be specifically interested in, in doing more like that. And so yeah. if anyone has tacit or things you've run into where you see that spark, let me know, because I've been living and eating and breathing this, and the Freeman Report was awesome. I've been throwing it at everyone. And so if you see anything right. like that, let me know. Uh, Graham Lampa from State Department in Public Diplomacy, uh, where we're the sort of the folks at the State Department on the cutting edge of technology, but I'm the only technology person in my <laughs> strategic planning office, so I understand the, <laughs> that the, uh, the barriers there. My question was about contractors and contracting generally and sort of the body shop companies as well, and the way, the degree to which the availability of personnel contracting, uh, which we also saw in the case of Edward Snowden, uh, where people aren't necessarily as vested in the organization, uh, it, this also, Susan, to your point where I was shaking my head about people who sort of parachute in from the outside, whether they're at the State Department Franklin Fellows or we have AAAS Fellows or even PIFs, for instance, not being seen as being invested in the organization yeah. and therefore being kept at arm's length. Yeah. And we generally, especially in public diplomacy, are hiring contractors with technical expertise and there's no way to bridge between the technical expertise and civil service because of just the division in your status, right? right? So then no one who has technology background has opportunity for advancement uh, to get into positions where they can actually have that, that, that um, sort of managerial oversight. Even if leadership is on board, that big middle of the organizations aren't being penetrated by people with, with uh, technical knowledge. So I wanted to have a, yeah. one thing one question on the degree to which the availability of contracting and smaller government perspectives and, and contracting that way has actually reduced yeah. uh, interest in civil service reform. Comments from and just a quick, panel. quick, I'll throw something on top of that, and then, <laughs> which is, <laughs> it, could be it, worse. it goes yeah. to the HR issue as well, which is, yeah. you know, for me to work at the FTC through regular channels took forever. Right. As a contractor, it takes like, you know, a tenth of the time and I can get in quickly and do a, a small work. So it's, it's a kind of a double-edged sword 
uh, to have contractors that get in quickly but then don't have this. Thing. So I, I want to give a him here to the long-term view. Teddy Roosevelt made his career on civil service reform. Mm -hmm. If we are always going to the very short-term answers to these questions, like find a way around it, mm -hmm. get sneak some guy in, mm -hmm. we'll never fix this problem. We have to confront these giant policy issues. But I, I think actually the um, the bigger issue is this this issue of focusing on these FTE limits, mm -hmm. as right. if that's very important, rather than asking what's the cost of government. Right. And I think uh, one of the things we're working on uh, through the president's um, uh, management um, council is actually developing benchmarks of what is the cost of technology in each agency and that's the all-in cost part of it is to expose the bigger than a bread box question and like why are you spending this much what are you getting for it? but more importantly so we can ask ourselves how can we best utilize those resources um, my view is look if we can get someone smart in as a federal employee that's ideal if I can get someone smart in as a contractor that'll work too the real trick is to get the smart people in working on our difficult problems as quickly as possible so that we can begin to resolve them. On that hopeful note, <laughs> I'll just say, obviously, huge challenges, but also some really interesting ideas about what the solution space can look like. We've heard a lot of good thoughts about 18F, presidential fellows, uh, innovation fellows, uh, all the things that are happening within government and civil society. And I will say, on a, on also on a hopeful note, I think if we were having this conversation 10 or 15 years ago, well, we wouldn't have been able to have this conversation. The level of sophistication within government and civil society has increased a lot, and it's demonstrated by uh, the sophistication and uh, real commitment to these issues that we've seen in the panelists that we have here today. So thank you all for being here. Please join me in thanking our group.